well, welcome. Welcome to the Forest Herd, North Carolina, Enjoying Your Woods workshop. Uh, my name is Jennifer Roach. I should turn my camera on here so you can see your time too. My name is Jennifer Roach and I'm a district forester with the North Carolina Forest Service. And I'm happy to be here moderating today. We've got two great speakers up that we look forward to hearing from. As we talked about, this is the Enjoying Your Woods workshop, and this is the first workshop in this series. So happy new year, and we're starting off the new year right with another series that is geared to uh, women out there. And, and we're unfortunate that we cannot gather together and be able to talk and interact and share, but uh, we're very glad that we can come into your, to your home and office through a, a virtual meeting. So with that, it does kind of make it hard to share, but we would love to know where you're from, where you're joining us today from, or what county your land is that you're managing or have questions about. So if you want to shoot that into the chat box and just tell us where you're from, where you're joining us today, we'd love to hear about it. Looks like we've got some already going. We've already got some folks from Iredale County and Orange County and Mebane and Durham and Raleigh. All right, there's Alexander County some down in Wilson, back to Graham. So it looks like we're starting to get a good group of folks from across the state. So that's wonderful to see. It looks like we've even got some folks from Blackstock, South Carolina. So wonderful to see. So thank you for joining us today. Before we go any further, if uh, you're not, we know that folks are doing a lot of virtual meetings now, but we wanna make sure that if you have a question or you would like to communicate with us, that you know how to do that. So Bob Barden with NC State Extension is actually behind the scenes and he's gonna come on and share with us some tips to make sure we can all communicate. All right, thanks Jennifer. Can you go to the next slide, please? So as we, uh, Jennifer, you advance the slide there. Thank you. Um, so as Jennifer indicated, I'm kind of working behind the scenes here today, but I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, I know more and more of us are doing these type of things since the pandemic started. Um, just a couple quick things here. One, if you want to uh, chat with us, if you're having technology issues, or if one of the presenters asks you to enter something into the chat, if you click on the little chat symbol, uh, and it says chat right below it, that will bring open your chat window and you can type in it just like if you're sending a text message uh, across your phone or something like that. If you have a question of the presenters today, we ask you that you use the Q&A feature of Zoom and there you'll just click on the Q&A icon and you'll be asked to enter your question there. Uh, we will get to those questions as the speakers uh, indicate. Uh, we do have closed captioning today. If you need that uh, service now, make sure you uh, turn that on for you. There again, click on the closed captioning symbol and that should make it available. It'll scroll at the bottom of the screen for you. If you need to get our attention for some reason, you can raise your hand, click on the little raise hand button. Uh, if you've typed into the chat window and you haven't seen a response or something, feel free to click on that and we will follow up with you and try to solve whatever issue you might have. Um, but if it's just in relations to the questions of the presenters, we will get to those as the presenter indicated. With the questions, there's a little thumb uh, symbol. As people ask questions and you look at them, you can actually what we call upvote the question. So if it's a similar type question as you have, and you want to indicate that you'd also like to hear that answer, just click on the little uh, hand with the thumb pointing up that's in the Q&A feature, and we'll uh, know that that is important to you. With that, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Great, thank you so much, Bob. All right, as, as Bob mentioned, we want to hear your questions, so please, if you've got questions as the speakers are talking, feel free to type them in that Q&A box. And the plan is to answer those questions at the end. So we're gonna let the speakers go through their presentation and we will ask those questions of that speaker at the very end. Uh, if for some reason your questions aren't getting answered or you still have a few more questions, this meeting will stop at 2.30, but we're still gonna stay online till three o'clock. So if you have more questions and you'd like to 
to continue the conversation after the presentations and after we're done with the meeting, then there'll be an opportunity for you to stay on and continue to ask questions of our panelists. So no worries there. Okay, so here's our agenda today. So we're gonna, we have two great speakers lined up for today. Our first speaker will be Brady Beck, who is the Southern Piedmont a Management Biologist of the Sand Hills with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. Uh, he is actually a, a nature photographer and loves to share his information and, and insight with us. He's unable to join us today, but so we will have, but he was gracious enough to provide us with a, a video presentation that he has, he has laid out for us. And, but if you have questions about that, Mallory Henderson, who is a communication specialist, also with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, is also on here today. And she's gonna help answer those questions. She has, um, she has taught classes such as smart photography and using your phone to take pictures in the past and is responsible for helping teach other Wildlife Resource Commission staff about those items. So she will be on here to help answer those questions. So without further delay, we will go ahead and turn it over to Brady Beck. I think we're still having a little bit of difficulty, but we're getting there. There we go. We'll look at a number of ways to improve your photography. Specifically, we're gonna explore light, composition, some photo tips, as well as some photo editing. Most of these tips will be iPhone based, but Android phones will have similar capabilities. Light is the essence of photography. Light has quality, it has intensity, it can be soft on a cloudy day, it can be very harsh on a sunny day, it can be very orange or warm in the morning or the evening, it can be very blue on cloudy days. So light is, is something that um, we can use to our advantage uh, to set a certain mood or to highlight a certain item in our, in our frame, for example. Um, one suggestion I always make is to, to get out early and or stay out late. So light is typically more pleasing to our eyes uh, early in the morning and late in the evening. Uh, midday can be somewhat harsh, so if you're if you're out shooting a landscape or something like that, um, maybe midday is not always the best time to uh, to try and capture that that beautiful light. Light is also directional, so from a from a subject standpoint, the subject can be front lit, the subject can be back lit or lit from the sides. So depending on the mood that you're after or your subject, um, that will depend on kind of your relationship, the photographer's relationship to your subject. In challenging lighting, um, sometimes the built-in flash in your phone or your camera uh, can help. Even in bright sunlight, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, but for example, um, these pitcher plants, uh, I used a little bit of flash and it, it filled in the shadows of this, this what would have other been a, a backlit subject. One of the most common compositional rules you'll hear about is the rule of thirds. So if you take your frame and cut it into a tic-tac-toe board, the rule suggests that you place your subject at one of those intersections and um, not centered on the image necessarily. Take both horizontal and vertical images of your subjects. You never know when you might need one or the other. Do what I call border patrol. Watch the edges of your, your frame while you're composing your shot. Maybe there's a branch sticking into it or a 
a blade of grass sticking into your frame that might be distracting. Um, recompose while you're still in the field and able to get a clean image rather than having to go back to your computer or to your phone after the fact and crop out that, that distracting element. So Brady asked us to share a poll at this time. So I'm gonna launch the poll. And uh, to participate, just click on your answer. And the poll is uh, basically ask, when is the best time of day to take the pictures? All right, it looks like we've uh, pretty much got everybody to answer at this time. So we'll uh, share those results with everybody. And as uh, you indicated uh, uh, in listening to Brady, the best time really is morning or evening with over half of you indicating that is the best time to take pictures uh, where others said all of the above, which is also when the light looks good for your subject. All right, we're going to, we'll continue the video now. Approach your subjects from all angles, top, bottom, left, right, front, back, inside, outside, close-ups, wide angles. Take a plant, for example, where you could use some help with identification. You'll want photos of the flower, flower parts, leaves, uh, orientation of the leaves, is it opposite or alternate, and maybe even habitat. So a little bit wider shot to show some of the other associated plants around it. When photographing landscapes, there are several different approaches you can take. First, you can try to show the breadth, the depth of a, of a habitat or a landscape. Um, I try to find a foreground element, something that is interesting that I can put relatively close to the camera, um, whether it's this pine snake or um, Maybe it's a flower or something that you want to put relatively close to the camera. When photographing wildlife, I've got a few tips specific to them. Try to get eye level with your subject uh, and be sure the eye is in focus. The rest of the image can be out of focus, but the eye has to be sharp. And also give them somewhere to go. Um, don't push their nose, for example, right up to the edge of the frame. Give them some, some empty room uh, where it looks like they can run off the frame. I like to look for patterns in nature as well. And you'll notice on several of these images that I will um, crop them to a square and when the the orange orchid comes up here you'll see kind of why that that makes sense it it draws your attention to just the subject and no other distracting elements around it these young longleaf pine buds uh, get kind of the same treatment HDR mode. So again, we have another poll for you to participate in. I'm going to launch that now. And the question is, when, photog when photographing plants, what are some of the details you can capture? Okay, most of you have answered. So I'm going to end the poll at this time. And uh, as and everybody pretty much indicated, uh, all of the above, you can capture uh, the habitat and including the plant, as well as leaf details and flower parts. Very good. Let me share those results so you can see them. 
Okay, we'll start the video back up again. Or high dynamic range allows your camera to capture more of the highlights and more of the shadows than a normal image would record. Turn your phone upside down to get the camera closer to the ground. So this toad, for example, is, you know, rather plain. It's, it's a low angle shot. It's, it's at its eye level. But in the second image, when you turn the phone basically upside down, you're looking up at your subject and it's just a different, interesting perspective. When trying to photograph things like butterflies that are fast moving and won't sit still, I like to incorporate a, a procedure I call shoot, creep, shoot. So take, a, take an image, move a little bit closer with your feet, take another image, move a little bit closer, take another image until you get to the final uh, desired size of the image. Delete blurry and autofocus photos from your phone to save memory and make space for the good stuff. To use your phone to capture a panoramic image, select Pano from the types of camera, hit the record button, and pan slowly from left to right following the arrow. And then press the shutter button again to finish recording. Your photo can now be edited as any normal photo would be. This next set of images were all taken from the same location beginning in April, just prior to a prescribed burn and following the vegetation response through that growing season into October of the same year. Keep an eye on the dead snag in the center of the image as it was blown over in a hurricane in September. When you're composing your images, tap on the screen of your phone to focus. And if you tap and hold, you can then change your exposure settings by dragging up or down to make the scene brighter or darker. The camera app that is built into your phone has some powerful editing tools. As you watch me edit in close to real time, you'll note that all of the values across the bottom are simply slider based. So if you want a photo to look more brilliant, you move the slider to the right. If you want less highlights, for example, you would move it to the left. To raise the shadows, same thing, move it right or left. Most of the time, these um, adjustments should be rather um, small adjustments. If you go too far in any one direction, the image usually looks overprocessed. Um, so, saturation is one that can really get out of hand if you go too far. Um, so be careful with it, but I would suggest you, you play with these, uh, these settings and, and find something that looks good to you and then maybe pull it back just a little bit rather than uh, um, sticking with what immediately looks good to you. Uh, sometimes it will, it will just be too much of an adjustment and it looks the photo will look fake. The crop tool, like the rest of the photo editing tools, do not make permanent changes to the image. 
So if you don't like the way it looked one day, the next week or, or even later, you can go back and re-edit the image and change its look, color, convert it to black and white, whatever you need to, to improve the image. So we have one more polling question. I'm gonna launch that now. And the question is, what, when attempting to photograph a butterfly, you should, please choose an answer. Okay, it looks like uh, we have, most of you have voted. Let me share that results with you. As, a, as the question was, when attempting to photograph a butterfly, you should, and most of you responded, take one image, move closer, take another image, and repeat until you have the shots you want. Almost 99% of you picked that. <laughs> and then 1% picked, don't bother, they never still sit still enough for me. And that's usually the case for me too. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and we'll begin the video again. Sometimes the light just really isn't that great. Convert it to a black and white. Try to brace your camera or your phone when you're taking pictures or video, wherever it's possible. Um, so use a little mini tripod. Um, place, place your hand or your phone up against a tree. Maybe set it on a fence, uh, on the hood of your truck, your car, whatever it is. Um, but the, the steadier you can make your phone, uh, the, the better your images will be, the fewer autofocus or shaky images that you'll create. If you have a subject that's difficult to focus on, try placing your hand or your notebook or something that's larger right beside the object and focus on that. Remove your hand or the notebook and snap the photograph. Also try photographing through other objects. So you'll have to tap on the flower, for example, in this one, but the fern in the foreground becomes out of focus. The camera in your cell phone can also be a really useful video camera. Here we're just documenting uh, one of our management techniques, but throwing together a quick little one minute video of a, a project like this is super simple. Uh, all can be done right in your cell phone, including adding the titles and uh, playing with audio and everything like that. So uh, shoot some video and uh, you never know when you might need it. Also try out the time-lapse function on your camera. This can be dropped right into a video project and uh, adds a little bit of uh, different feel to your, to your normal time videos.
Okay. Uh, well, that uh, looks like uh, the end of Brady's video presentation there. He definitely provided us some cool uh, tricks and things to use our smartphone. I think there at one time I actually had my smartphone pulled out. He was uh, sharing some things. I guess I haven't played with either, but um, hopefully everyone else out there was able to learn some cool tricks. Of course, so as you can see, there was some drone footage in there. And uh, one of our panelists thinks that he probably put his smartphone on that drone and was still getting some of that video footage. So he has some beautiful images. Uh, we do have some questions. So Mallory Henderson, of course, with North Carolina Wildlife Commission, who is also very familiar with smart photography and, and does this for a living as well. Um, we're gonna try to ask her some of these questions. So Mallory, we're gonna, how about our first one here? Macro photos with the phone. How is that possible? Right. So um, I'm trying to figure out how to unmute my video, but it won't let me. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so macro photos. Um, so the part that you saw. Oh, no, I still can't turn on my camera. Sorry. OK. Um, so macro photos, the part where you saw where he was tapping on the screen to focus. Um, so that's also how you take macro photos. You get pretty close to your subject and you tap on it to focus. Um, my, there we go. Hey. <laughs> um, so my biggest tip for that is so if you're up close on like a little flower or something and you tap and you can't get it to focus, move away a little bit and try it again and see if you can get it in focus. Um, and then you can just crop it closer after the fact. Um, if you have a newer smartphone, a lot of those have something called portrait mode. Um, so if you're in portrait mode, you can tap and focus on a subject and it will actually like blur the background. Um, it's something that you'll see a lot in professional photography where the subject is super clear and the background is super blurry. Um, that's what you get with portrait mode. So it makes your subject like really, really stand out. Um, hope that helps. <laughs> Um, what kind of spot does Brady use? I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> it looks fancy though. <laughs> um, and I answered a few questions in text um, throughout. Um, so I was going to go over a couple of those. Um, the tips on taking photos from a boat. Um, so my advice for that was to like kind of keep your knees bent um, and try to stay fluid so that you're not moving your upper body too much. Um, it's kind of hit or miss, but I also recommend keeping the live photo setting on. So on an iPhone, I don't know what that is on an Android if it's the same thing, um, but on an iPhone, you have live photos and live photos you can, it sort of takes like a really short video. And then when you go to edit, you can choose which frame looks the best. So if part of it came out blurry, there might be another frame in that live photo that you can pick from that's not blurry. Um, so that should help when you're in a place where you're moving a lot. Um, what else do I have? The high dynamic range, the HDR thing, um, I think maybe some of that got cut off. I don't use HDR very often, um, just if the light is really bad because it takes up like a huge amount of space on the phone. <laughs> um, and what about keeping the horizon level when you're in yeah, camera? Um, so, I know a lot of times when I'm, I'm taking a panoramic, I feel like I want to hold my phone really far out. Um, don't do that. Hold it closer to your body. And it's easier if you kind of turn your body, I think, um, rather than trying to move your arms. If you move your body, it'll keep it even. And it'll tell you on the phone, a little text will pop up and it'll say move up or move down if you're going too far off of the line. new questions in portrait mode yeah okay so in portrait mode when our best use of the natural light studio or contour mode so um if you're photographing wildlife you're most likely just going to be using the natural light um the studio and stuff is more for indoors or like weird light situations um i almost never hop off of um, the natural light setting because I really am only taking pictures of stuff outside for the most part. <laughs> um, and the studio ones are more for like actual portraits of humans and that kind of thing. It's more for 
I guess contouring shadows like on your face so you don't look weird or washed out. How did you get to zoom in so close on the photos of the bird? Um, yeah, I have no idea. I had that question as well. Um, I'm not sure if those photos were taken with a phone or not, or if he had like one of those clip on lenses. Um, or you can also take photos through binoculars or spotting scopes, but usually that'll give you a round photograph. Um, so I would say that was a telephoto lens. I don't, unless he was up on a ladder or in the tree, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's all we have open right now. Okay, well, if you have any more questions out there, you know, put them in the, the Q&A and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Uh, if that's all the questions we have so far, once again, uh, we hate Brady couldn't, couldn't join us today, but we, uh, we we'll definitely are, are very thankful for his tips and tricks. And I think uh, Kelly Douglas may have put his website, BradyBeckPhotography.com, in the chat box if anyone was interested in checking out more photographs. Yes. So if you want to check him out, he's there. Definitely be some beautiful images. All uh, right. Well, I will go ahead and come to video. more questions, then we will move on to our next speaker. All right. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Colleen Offenbutel. So she is a black bear and fur bear biologist down, down east. And she's gonna talk with us today about using your remote camera to take pictures. All right. All right. I, I guess my first, I, I guess my first question is, is, is uh, can everybody see my screen? <laughs> yes, it looks great. All right. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, as mentioned earlier, I sure wish I could see you all in person. I like to see everybody's faces and interact on a more personal level, but uh, at least we have this uh, virtual environment to, to interact as best as we can. Um, as mentioned on the uh, Black bear and fur bear biologist. Um, the only correction is I'm statewide. So uh, the, the entire state is under my responsibility. And today I'm gonna to talk about remo uh, using remote cameras to learn more about the wildlife on your property. And I'm gonna preface this by saying that um, this could probably be easily two to three different talks because there is so much I could share with you guys about remote cameras. I'm, kind of going to keep it basic. I know we probably have a diverse audience. Some of you may have used these row cameras before. Some of you maybe have never even seen one. Um, it's going to be pretty basic, but for those of you that maybe have more experience using these cameras, um, hopefully towards the end of this presentation, I'm kind of going to go over tips and tricks that I use when I deploy these cameras to make sure they're doing exactly what I want them to do. Um, and so hopefully you'll gain something from that. So let's just jump on in. And first, I wanted to mention that uh, remote cameras aren't new. They've actually been around for years, uh, ever since really cameras were first created. Um, and so we've been using remote cameras for quite a bit. Um, you know, the, the difference is that um, up until we were really limited in how we used them. Um, it's only within the last 20 years that we've seen advancements in the technology that have made these remote cameras more economical, more efficient, and much more effective at monitoring wildlife. And what the pictures I have up there is, is kind of the remote cameras I was using. Uh, one, the one uh, with the ammo box, um, that's one I used up until the year 2000, in which if we wanted to get remote pictures of wildlife, in this case, we were trying to get black bears in Virginia, um, up until that point, we would put a film camera in an ammo box with a hole in it, and the triggering device would be fishing line. Um, you were limited to 36 pictures and even less because half the time the bear would just destroy your triggering device, that fishing line. So you got lucky if you got two or three photos um, every time you visited. Then around 2000, we still were stuck with film cameras, still stuck with 36 pictures between visits. But that was the first time we started to see these, you know, boxes built specifically for these cameras that were waterproof, as well as introduced a new triggering device. Instead of using fishing line, 
it started to use what we call infrared, which is what I'll explain later. Um, but again, we were limited by 36 pictures. However, as mentioned, thankfully, in the last 20 years, We've really seen the advent of digital cameras and it really, the digital camera really helped revolutionize um, remote cameras. Um, now we see remote cameras come in all shapes and sizes. They can store thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of pictures. The batteries can last forever, it seems. These cameras can even take video and some of them can even send pictures remotely to your cell phone using cellular technology. If you're looking to buy a remote camera, it can easily get pretty overwhelming. I know sometimes I get overwhelmed when I'm trying to decide what type of camera I want to use on a project. If you go to Cabela's, for example, um, I went on it yesterday just to see how many cameras they had. And I saw that they had 60 different camera models from seven different brands. Um, so you can quickly maybe get overwhelmed, but hopefully my talk will help you more understand what your options are and hopefully make you feel more confident in selecting a camera and using it. I want to go over some basics first. Um, one, I call them remote cameras, but they have a lot of different names. Some people call them wildlife cameras, trail cameras, and probably the most common term used is game cameras. Certainly, if you go to like Cabela's or Bass Pro or Gander Mountain, you know, they're probably more likely going to refer to them as game cameras. Um, the cost, there's a high range in cost. Usually you can get a camera starting at 50 bucks. They go all the way to over $600. Though again, costs have gone down considerably. I remember when some of these cameras were well over $1,000 to purchase. So they've gotten, again, a lot cheaper. Um, most cameras have two triggering mechanisms. You know, the trigger is what causes a photo to be taken. The first triggering mechanism is actually a dual sensor. There's two ways it works. Um, it's a combination of motion, the animal moving or the human moving, as well as combined with what we call passive infrared. I mentioned infrared earlier. Um, what the infrared is doing is it is sensing something, an object, in this case likely an animal or human, that is warmer than the ambient temperature. And it senses when that item is moving in front of the camera. That's what triggers it to go off. Um, these sensors can be really sensitive to the ambient temperature. So, for example, on a really hot day, down east when it's almost 100 degrees and humid, we do see sometimes these cameras have issues with detecting an animal because at that point, the animal is very similar in temperature to the ambient temperature. Whereas at the reverse, we see in colder weather, man, these cameras really good at detecting wildlife because that wild animal is so much warmer than the, the cool winter weather, such as a 30 degree day. So that's one triggering mechanism. Again, motion combined with that heat signature, I'll call it from the animal. The other way a camera is triggered is called time lapse in which you actually set the trigger to go off every minute, every hour, twice a day, once a day, or other times. It's a time trigger. Uh, this isn't a feature most people uh, take advantage of because you could end up with a lot of photos as well as you can end up with a lot of photos with nothing in them because on the time trigger, that camera is going to take a picture um, no matter whether there's an animal in the frame or not. We really see this trigger be a benefit if you're wanting to capture animals that don't produce much of a heat signature, such as your herps and amphibians. So one of our biologists, Jeff Hall, who does a lot of snake research, he will put his remote cameras on a timer to document snake activity. Again, because the infrared uh, won't detect the snake, but that time trigger will capture it. So what are the benefits of using remote camera? Well, it's another tool in your tool belt. There's, you know, you should always employ several tools if you're wanting to learn more about the wildlife on your property or in a certain area. Um, and the remote camera is just one of several tools you can use, but it is a tool that's fairly non-invasive, meaning you don't need to actually touch the animal to learn whether it's on your property and what it's doing. So pretty non-invasive. It's low maintenance. Most of these cameras are pretty good that once you deploy them, all you have to do is check them to replace the memory card and put in fresh batteries. 
These cameras are great. Unlike us, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't get tired. Again, unless the batteries go out. Uh, the data is very accessible and shareable because it's in the form of pictures. Um, so you can easily access those pictures as well as share them with uh, your family and friends and whoever else you'd like to. And the other thing is it collects information that you don't have to. So these cameras will automatically collect the time and date that the picture was taken, temperature, as well as the moon phase. So here's what a typical remote camera looks like. Um, this is one that I've used extensively. And it's called the clamshell style. And it's called clamshell because it opens just like a clam. You know, you see when you open it up, you see the batteries and other features. Most of these cameras, you have to open up in a way in order to access the batteries and also set up the menu, which will help with the settings on the camera. Here's another camera that I use as well. A little bit of a different design in which only the bottom half opens up. But again, similar in that you have to open up that bottom half to uh, access the menu to set up the camera. Now I'm going to make a comment. Um, and that is, I much prefer the clamshell over these ones that open in the bottom half, just because I feel the clamshell style is more water resistant. Um, I've deployed quite a few of the camera you see on your screen. They work great, but I've noticed uh, in the more humid and warm environment of Eastern North Carolina, these are failing at a much higher rate than my clamshell cameras. And I think it's because that humidity is more easily able to get in. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at cameras. Now, these cameras look much different than the camera on your phone or traditional camera that you would use, such as a digital SLR camera. So I want to just point out some key features um, of these cameras so you understand what you're looking at when you purchase or use a camera. One, as indicated by the red arrow, that's your lens. That, that's what's going to capture the photo for you. The next is a flash. Just as with a regular camera, these remote cameras do have flashes to help improve the image captured in low light and dark conditions. What we're seeing now is most flashes that come on these cameras are made with LED lights and that there's two main types of flashes. Um, here, what I'm featuring in this slide in particular is one flash called IR flash or infrared. And what it does is it still produces a light, but it produces a light in the infrared spectrum. That spectrum is invisible to both animals and people. The other type of flash that you'll typically see on a remote camera, though I'm seeing it less and less on models, is your traditional white flash type of flash, you know, white light. And obviously that white light is visible to both animals and people. Um, so in the next slide, I'm kind of going to show you, you know, the differences and what you'll see in your photo between these two flash, these two types of flashes. So here we see a photo taken with your traditional white flash. Again, white flash you have on your, your camera phone, you have on a, a handheld phone or a handheld camera. And what we see, the, first, the main difference that hopefully jumps out to everybody listening and watching is that with the white flash, we get a color photograph at night. And with the infrared flash, it's black and white or grayscale at night. That is one advantage of using a remote camera with a white flash is that nighttime photos, you know, the, the picture usually is better. It improves the picture quality and may better help improve your ability to identify an animal versus a black and white photo. However, there is a disadvantage to using that white flash. Again, improvement in photo quality, improvement in maybe identifying not only the animal, but maybe the, an individual animal. The negative is that white flash can be seen by animals, and they are going to be easily spooked once that camera goes off. And guess what else can see the white flash? People, humans, including potential trespassers on your property. So these trespassers, they see the white flash. Now they know two things. One, oh, there's a camera, and it caught me. And two, I know where that camera is. Um, so it, that might lead to some theft. Uh, most researchers and biologists, including myself, we select remote cameras with the infrared flash. Again, because it doesn't spook the animal, 
as well as people can't see it, so it reduces theft. Personally, yeah, there's been one, you know, a few times where it's hard to see the animal in a black and white photo, but that isn't common. Um, and by the way, this applies to video as well. Say you buy a remote camera and you want it to take video, which most of them are capable of doing. You know, if you use a white flash, that video at night will be in color. Whereas if you use an IR flash, that video will be in black and white, um, you know, at night. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about of, of what you're seeing when you have a remote camera in hand is this passive infrared sensor, um, often called PIR, but it, it's the major sensor for that camera, which is why it takes up so much space on both of the cameras that I have on this slide. What that sensor is doing is sensing the ambient temperature again, sensing that ambient temperature to try to detect the animal. Again, it's, you know, one of the triggering mechanisms for these cameras is the heat signature that's given off both animals and people as they move in front of the camera. All right, I guess it's question time. Um, I'm new to this, so hopefully I do this correctly. There we go. Yeah, what is the difference between a white flash and an IR flash, also called infrared flash? I'm going to assume the moderators are going to tell me when it's time to share the answer. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, there you go. He's got it up for you. All right. All right. Oh, you guys are awesome. Thanks. Think to me. Yes. Yes. The difference is the IR flash produces the black and white images seen at night. Cost is not a factor. I haven't really noticed that there's much difference in cost between cameras that have the white flash versus cameras with the IR flash. Um, and it's the white flash, not the IR flash that spooks the animals, as well as it's the IR flash that cannot be seen by wildlife, not the white flash. All right, good job, everybody. You guys, we got a smart audience. All right, next. Some more basics. So I showed you what the typical exterior of a remote camera looks like. Now we've opened it up. Again, the clamshell design. This is one example I'm showing. So you open it up, and in this case, you see the batteries. Most of these remote cameras are pretty battery hungry. Um, they need six to eight AA batteries. And one thing I'm going to say, I highly, highly, highly recommend Energizer High Lithium batteries. They are more expensive but they work much better with these cameras. They will not only last longer, um, sometimes up to a year, depending on your camera settings, but they're gonna ensure that the trigger speed on the camera, the time lapse between photos um, is quick and meets the manufacturer's expectations and design. So I know they're expensive, but put these in there. If you put regular batteries in there, the camera will still work, but you're gonna be going through a lot of batteries over time. Next up, number two, the, the card slot. So these all typically require a card, an SD card, um, which you can easily buy not only at outdoor stores, but Target, Walmart, Amazon. Um, you put these in either the bottom of the camera or sometimes the side of the camera. Next up is the power switch. And it's not only a power switch to turn the camera on and off, but the other thing it does is it helps you access the setup menu for your camera where you're going to go in and make the settings. Next is the LCD screen. This screen, um, first, I would recommend you buy remote cameras that have the screen. If they don't have the screen, I probably would pass on that camera. Um, this LCD screen is very helpful, helps you perform two main functions. One, helps you set up the camera because that's where you can set the clock, the date, how many pictures you want to take per detection. So say your camera detects a deer, you can set it to take just one photo of the deer or three photos of the deer. Um, so that's where you're going to use that screen to help you navigate the menu. The second key role of that screen is it's going to allow you to review the photos that were taken, which is really helpful when you're setting up your camera and checking to make sure that camera is facing the area you want to capture. And then, of course, once you have the camera set up, you have it facing where you want. When you check 
camera, you can use that LCD screen to, to scroll through your photos to make sure you're capturing what you want and to make sure the camera is operating appropriately. Most cameras, as indicated by five, have a menu button. Um, that's how you access the menu and the settings. And lastly, arrows to navigate both the menu, but also to scroll through photos. And some of these also allow you to zoom in on a photo. So say you're scrolling through and you're like, what is that little thing in the LCD screen? You're trying to figure it out. You can actually sometimes zoom in if you want. Again, just another camera type. Again, similar features. The main thing I want to point out here is that unlike the previous camera where you put the SD card in the bottom, here you put it in the side. The other difference is whereas before you saw the batteries when you opened up that camera, here the batteries are actually a little bit hidden. Um, they're number one, There's a, that's a battery release and then the batteries come out and that's where you place the batteries on this particular camera. But again, very similar as the previous slide. So, as mentioned earlier, lots of different options on the market. It can become overwhelming. So I wanted to talk about some considerations um, before you purchase a camera and some recommendations I have for all of you all. One is cost. As I said, cameras range from $50 to $600. I have found that the cameras that I use for our research projects on the commission average about $150 to $200 a piece. At, at that price point, I'm getting all the features I need. So you don't have to spend a lot. To be honest, you could probably buy a $50 camera and get some really good photos and information. Just that from my experience, yeah, I'm typically buying about $150 to $200 camera. Anything more than that, you're probably getting extra bells and whistles that you may never take advantage of. Image quality, of course, we want a good image quality because we want to be able to see the animal and identify it. You'll find that cameras come from two megapixels to 20 megapixels. I would say if you can get a camera around seven to 10 megapixels, you're going to do fine. That picture is going to be great. Be very cautious of buying a camera that is at one end of the extreme, such as 20 megapixel. It could take fabulous photos, but we've also seen some of these manufacturers they offer a higher megapixel camera because it sounds good. They know the public might be interested because you hear more megapixels. You assume the photo quality is going to be better, but then they put in a poor quality lens. So be really cautious. And I've seen examples of remote cameras that take three megapixel pictures versus remote cameras that take 15 megapixels. You can't tell the difference um, because part of what goes into image quality is the lens of that camera. Again, shoot for about 7 to 10 megapixels. You'll be fine. Trigger time. Now, trigger time is a time in which the camera detects the movements and then takes the pictures. Um, as a lot of you may be experienced, if you have kids or grandkids or if you have pets, especially, you know, cats, you know, you, you, you got, you know, when you want to take that picture, boy, having a quick trigger speed is important because that kid or cat or dog is just moving so quickly. So definitely here, fast trigger time. The faster, the better. All right. Battery and power options. For the most part, I would go for power options that rely on battery. I think there's some that rely on solar. I, I don't have much experience with it, but when I have looked into it, it just seems like a, a lot to deal with, a lot to set up. So I rely on batteries, and really all these cameras are good at using batteries efficiently. So really, I wouldn't really worry yourself about that. Again, the key is to look for those Energizer high lithium batteries, those silver batteries. All right, next up, range of detection. And what we mean by that is basically, you know, the number of feet in which the camera is able to detect the animal in front of the camera in order for it to be triggered. Typically, the longer the range, the better. Um, and I would say the average range that I work with is about 60 to 70 feet. If I can get an animal detected six, up to 60 to 70 feet in front of the camera, I'm pretty happy with that. And I suspect in most places you're setting these cameras, such as along a trail, if you can get, you know, a camera to go off within, you know, 5 to 10 feet, you're doing well. Memory card. The big thing is is that's really dependent on the card you use, not the camera itself, but the card. I would recommend using 32 gigabytes. Some folks use four to eight gigabytes. 
Um, you can, but you're going to have to check the camera more frequently because that card will get fuller versus a 32 gigabyte memory card. I, I have experienced when I use 32 gigabyte memory card, I rarely ever run out of memory space. I rarely check my camera after a month or two and it says the card's full. Um, and I'll give an example of really the very few times that will happen to you. So yeah, get the 32 gigabyte memory card, especially if you're doing video. I've already talked about flash versus infrared. To me, that's a personal preference. If, if you really want high quality photos at night and you're not worried about theft, go with the white flash. So be aware that, yeah, you might spook the animal. Um, again, as I said, I only purchase the infrared, but it's really personal preference. And then video or picture, again, personal preference. Most cameras come with both features, but there are some that only will take a picture and not video, or if they do take video and picture, the video is kind of low quality. Um, that's your personal preference. If, if you want to really learn animal behaviors, then you might want to go with video. Uh, for the most part, and almost all the research I do, I'm focused on getting a picture. All right, another question. Da -da -da. All right, question time. Of all the considerations to purchase a remote camera, which is the most important to you? And I'm going to say there's no right answer. This is more I just want to see what you think would be most important when you're in the store looking at all those cameras. All right, I guess, again, I guess someone's going to, share the results. There we go. All right. Looks like image quality is the top preference by everybody, followed by cost and trigger speed. Um, ha, one person did say if it comes in camo. <laughs> I will say uh, my, my answer would have been trigger speed followed by cost. Uh, I want to make sure during these research projects I'm capturing that animal, but cost is definitely a big factor as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right, moving on. Uh, so now here's some things to consider when you're deploying your camera, because not only buying the right camera for your purposes is, is, is pretty important, but what's even more important, what really is going to impact whether you get the pictures you're expecting is how you deploy that camera. So put a lot of more thought into this. One, knee height. Put that camera at knee height. If you put it any higher, I see a lot of people, they go out in the field and they put the camera out at chest height because they're standing. If you do that, you're going to miss your small and mid-sized animals, such as bobcats and foxes. The other thing is always test your camera. When you put your camera out, test to make sure it's operating as it should. It's taking pictures where you want it to take pictures. One thing that I cannot stand is some manuals will tell you to do a walk test in which they tell you walk towards the camera to make sure that camera is, is taking pictures of yourself. Think about it. What an, wild animal walks like us, walks like a human? Uh, the, the, the Bigfoot, if he's real, perhaps, but that's it. So what I tell people is be the animal. When you're testing that camera, be the animal. Walk like an animal, and that means getting on all fours and walking in front of it to make sure that camera uh, can detect you, because if it can detect you, it should be able to detect any other wild animal walking in front of the camera. Don't set your camera randomly on your property. Um, animals aren't random. They have patterns to them. A lot of times they're going to walk along trails just like we do. They're going to take the path of least resistance. So set along current trails or potential travel corridors, such as my colleague here. We, we identified this kind of dry ditch that we suspected animals were using. So set along there rather than random. Set Basically set where the camera Set the camera where you expect to see wildlife. Just as for those of you that are hunters in the audience, you want to just randomly hunt on your property. You would hunt an area where you would expect to see deer, bear, or wild turkey. Do the same with this camera. And again, you're, you know, if you have a sense an animal's using that area, you're probably right. Here we got that, that same spot. We got a river otter using it. Baiting. That's really going to be a personal preference, and that's there's pros and cons to using baiting to try to attract wildlife to your camera site. Um, baiting does has its benefits. It pretty much will guarantee that you're going to document some wildlife on your property, such as deer, bear, or raccoon. Um, 
you know, and there's some benefits to baiting, not only guaranteeing you're going to see certain wildlife, um, but that maybe that wildlife will stay there long enough for you to really identify it. And in this case, maybe if you're interested in size, you can start determining the size of the animals on your property, such as this case of bear. Or again, with deer, holding them long enough that not only can you determine sex of the animal, but in this case with deer, the antler size. I've also seen, you know, I use baiting for some of our surveys, not a big corn pile, in this case a sardine can. The other benefit of baiting for some wildlife surveys is it helps us attract certain wildlife species. They may not otherwise, you know, be detected by our camera because it's too fast or too small, or perhaps it's the type of wild animal that is less likely to use wildlife trails extensively and, and more just scampers through the woods. In this case, this is a weasel. Um, probably wouldn't have gotten a weasel at this site had we not used the sardines. So we were able to capture it even quickly. <laughs> it's a blur, but we know it's a weasel. Um, this animal probably wouldn't have come in front of our camera. It just would have wandered away and not even known the camera was there or been detected. However, I'm going to talk about some drawbacks to baiting. Um, it does create an unnatural situation and can possibly introduce diseases such as rabies, which is introduced through saliva. Here we've got deer and raccoon all with their noses and, and uh, mouths all in the same corn pile. And we do sometimes get deer that uh, test positive for rabies, and this might be one, one area of transmission. The other negative about baiting is it, it, it can artificially increase and boost certain populations, such as in this photo, we've got five raccoons. And note, this is in March. This is before young are born. Um, it's supporting and increasing maybe the population artificially. The other thing you got to keep in mind is while baiting can guarantee you're going to see certain wildlife, it may actually keep other wildlife from coming in that are more wary of a bait pile, either because of the bait itself just seems too unnatural or because of the other wildlife coming to the bait pile, that wildlife doesn't want to come in. And that's the thing is if you don't bait, but you go on game trails or, or wildlife trails, you're going to capture wildlife. So I wanted to show you some pictures of wildlife I've captured without bait. Here in this case, we've got a barred owl. Here we've got our nice fat beaver. This might be hard to see, but this is a nice, you know, uh, white-tailed deer, a buck. So here we're able to still detect our deer, still detect sex, as well as antler size without using bait. And a coyote. You know, coyotes are interesting. You might still get them at a bait pile, but a lot of times that's just too weird and odd for them to go into. So sometimes if you're trying to determine you know, if you have coyotes or some like bobcats on your property, not using bait is better. And then you can still get those comp, you know, those animals that will go into bait, such as squirrels, um, without having to use bait to capture them. This is key, clear vegetation. Uh, vegetation that's moving in the wind is going to cause your camera to potentially take pictures and a lot of pictures. So when you put your camera up, remove any obvious branches or other vegetation that may cause your camera to go off. Again, I rarely have a full memory card when I use thir a 32 gigabyte card, but the few times I've had a full memory card after you know checking after a month is because it took nothing but waving branches. Um, very annoying. Plus, it's a lot of photos I have to go through to determine if there's an animal there or not. To so clear that vegetation, this tip, it's going to sound silly, but get in the habit of when you put your camera up and you're ready for it to go, say out loud, camera on. Um, I've experienced and colleagues of mine have experienced that they forgot to turn the camera on or forgot to move it from the setup mode to the on mode. If you verbalize out loud to turn on the camera, even if you're by yourself, it helps you remember whether you did it or not. There's been plenty of times I've walked away from my camera and I'm like, oh, did I? And thankfully I'm like, oh, yep, I verbalized it. And I could, uh, I could sleep at night knowing that camera was working. Two more tips I wanna talk about. One, think about the sun. Think about the sun when you set up your camera. Um, if you set up your camera aimed either at the rising sun or the setting sun, that sun's going to cause false triggers as well as result in really poor exposure and backlighting of your photos. 
So keep the sun in mind when you set these cameras, as well as control your scent. And to be honest, the best way to control your scent is not to visit your camera all the time. I visit most of my cameras once a month. Um, I would say at minimum, don't visit more than every two weeks. Again, you don't want a lot of your scent there because that will impact wildlife detection. Some wildlife are more wary than others of human scent. So if you're checking your camera all the time, you're not only leaving a lot of scent, but creating a lot of disturbance. So yeah, once you put your camera out, try to visit it every two weeks to every month. All right, question time. What is the best way to set up your camera? All right. Let's, I guess we'll, there we go. Hey, you guys are still me. Thank you. Yes, the answer is none of the above. All the answers, uh, one through four, are actually the opposite of what you should do. So very good. All right, we're nearing the end of my presentation. So. One more thing I want, I mean, I want to talk about, about deploying your cameras is boxes versus straps. Uh, a lot of folks don't invest in security boxes or locking cables when they buy their cameras because they kind of feel they've already spent quite a bit of money. So they just use the straps that come with the camera. The benefit of using straps that come with the camera is it's really easy and quick to deploy. Boom, you just strap the camera around the tree and you're done. And of course, it's cheaper because you're not buying any other accessories. However, there's a couple of cons. The first con is if you live in bear country, a bear is going to investigate your camera. Um, potentially other wildlife will, but, you know, I've seen deer kind of check out cameras, but especially a bear. So without that box, not only will that bear tear down your camera, potentially damaging it, um, sometimes these bears will destroy your camera. So then again, you've lost your camera to an animal. But to be honest, the other more likely thing that's going to happen is someone's going to steal your camera. I mean, if it's just hooked up there with straps, that's a really easy camera to take versus using a security box. So how I use them, and I've probably deployed, I was trying to think of it, I've probably deployed over a thousand cameras over the years, and I've always used security boxes. Um, and I have yet to have a camera stolen. It's just never happened. Um, what I do with the security box is I have my box, I get a lag bolt that you can buy at any hardware store, usually about a two inch lag bolt, and either using elbow grease with a socket wrench or a drill, you know, I put the lag bolt through, you know, with the security box, there's usually a hole in the back of that security box you buy, and lag bolt the box to the tree, put my camera in, and then put my lock, either a padlock and a, a locking cable, or just a locking cable. Um, if you do that, it's going to be really hard. Basically, someone's going to have to cut down that tree to get your camera. Very unlikely. Again, I haven't had it happen since. The other benefit of doing this is once you put that security box on the tree, it's there to stay for a while. When you go back to check your camera, you take your camera out, check it. With the straps, you have to readjust the camera again, make sure you set the camera back up how you want it. With this box, it's stationary. So, you know, you know, once you set up the camera where you want, it's going to remain in the spot how you want it. And it does take extra time to do this. It's worth it. It's, if you're going to invest in cameras, invest in the boxes as well and invest in the time to set these up. You'll be happy. All right. Just wanted to show a, a couple of a fun video, a couple cases, examples of how I've used cameras. Um, we do have two species of skunks in North Carolina, the eastern spotted skunk and striped skunk. Uh, eastern spotted skunks are only in western North Carolina, and so we've used them to document the presence and their occupancy. And then I have a project right now in which I'm using cameras to determine how use of wildlife underpasses has changed over time. Uh, we have some wildlife underpasses under the highway in eastern North Carolina, and we wanted to see is wildlife using these underpasses more or less than when they were originally constructed. And so that kind of gets to ideas for you all, ideas for how you can use these cameras on your property to learn more of what's going on. One, it's just a basic tool to inventory the wildlife that is on your property. And in addition, if say you do a timber harvest or some other habitat management on your property, if you have cameras out before and after, you can see how the wildlife responded. 
Um, these cameras can help determine habits of species, which one are nighttime active, which ones are daytime active, what time of year they're most active and least active. You can detect trespassers. If trespassers are a concern on your property, these cameras can help you. Again, infrared, if you're going to do that. Uh, help you detect invasive species, such as feral hogs. Some of these invasive species, like the feral hog, it is important to know when they're on your property as soon as possible, because that's your best chance of eradication. So cameras can help you detect some of these concerning species. Uh, these cameras can help identify areas that have the game species. Maybe you're interested in hunting or allowing others to come on and hunt. And another idea is if you have wildlife visiting an area, but you're not sure what that wildlife is, or if you think you have wildlife damaging, causing some damage on your property, put out the camera to identify it. And one thing I want to note is sometimes we'll get to see property damage and the, you know, that person's convinced it's, it's a wild animal. Once we put the cameras out, sometimes we discover it's, it's the owner's own dogs or it's the neighborhood dogs. Uh, so cameras can really help you identify what's going on. All right, and this is the last question. Uh, and again, no, no wrong answer. Well, there might be one wrong answer, <laughs> but overall, no wrong answer. What well, would most interest you in using a remote camera on your property? Uh, we just got about a, a minute left, so or a minute or two oh, left. Oh, shoot. Go ahead and wrap it up. <laughs> we'll give yeah, some sorry about that. <laughs> well, one thing I want to put out there is, yes, these resources. So as there are, hey, most, so most people want to confirm the wildlife visiting their land. All right, followed by inventory. So yeah, here are some resources. Uh, number one, trailcampro.com. Tons of reviews on almost every trail camera. Go there. That's a great resource. Um, as well as email me, especially if you've put a camera out and you're not sure what you saw, contact me. I'll help identify that critter for you. If I can't identify it, I've got a whole wildlife commission of biologists I can turn to for help. So, yeah, I wanted to make sure you got that resources. And sorry to take up so much of your time. Thank you. So that was great, Colleen. You, you've got a lot of questions here, so um, you can probably help add to all this as you, as you talk. Uh, that was great information. So the first one you had was just identifying individual foxes that are visiting regularly. So how would you go about doing that or maybe a suggestion there for Robert? Yeah, so I mean, you can definitely tell the difference between red fox and gray fox with these cameras because um, we do have those two different species. In terms of identifying individual foxes, unless there's a mark on them, um, it's really hard. A lot of these wildlife species, foxes, even bears, um, you know, it's hard to identify individuals because they just look so similar to each other. You know, deer, you can sometimes tell the difference because of the antlers, um, you know, but yeah, that is a challenge and, and probably you won't be able to identify individuals unless there's an obvious mark on the animal. All right. Um, Do you want to talk see. about the ring, the ring doorbell real quick? Yes. Yeah, yeah, someone asked if they could use a ring doorbell to be mounted in such a way as utilized as a nature camera. I've never seen that. I do get people sending me ring videos of, of wildlife that, you know, went in their front yard and, you know, set off the ring video, and they'll send me the video to, to confirm identification. So certainly a ring video will document a wild animal, um, but in terms of setting up specifically as a nature camera, that I, I haven't seen that before. So uh, if it's possible, try it out and let me know how it worked out for you. All right, okay, what about, uh, uh, looks like Dottie's having trouble detecting birds. Do you think they get off, get off enough heat? Yeah, um, that is one problem with bird. It's a couple things with birds. You know, they're a small animal, and so unlike a big bear, that, boy, that's a huge heat signature. You got a small animal that, yeah, it's not going to give as much heat as well. As, think how fast a bird moves. It's just flittering and fluttering. Um, you know, wild turkeys are pretty good at being detected by these cameras, but smaller birds, I would say in that case, if your tr goal is to try to get smaller birds, like songbirds, it, it's, you know, basically setting the camera really close to where you think that bird's going to land. The closer the camera is, you're reducing that detection zone 
but you're increasing the chance that that camera's going to go off. So really, if you're trying to get birds and you're missing them, if they're landing like at a, a, a bird feeder or a water bowl, set that camera pretty close because that'll increase the chance the camera detects the animal. Um, if the camera is near a road, will it pick up the heat of the car? It will. Um, I have cameras that I've set up on some of our roads on our game lens, and I get trucks and cars and lawn mowers. Uh, so, yes, it, it will. But, I mean, unless it's a well-traveled road, you might get a few cars. But, again, it's not going to eat up your battery, and it's not going to eat up your memory space if you're checking that camera about once a month. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Spooking animals at a, the, at a patio. Okay, Travis. if I wanted to spook animals, oh, go ahead, Dan. Okay, what, okay, I, I'm not sure which, <laughs> if, okay, I, if, you I'm gonna, to, if you wanted to spook animals around the patio garden, do you think that would work, and, and really is that ethical? Yeah, I suspect that question more follows from Brady's talk. Um <sighs> Boy, I would say, I mean, from a biologist perspective, we encourage people not to harass or haze wildlife, you know, try not to do things that would cause your behavior to impact that animal. So to be honest, overall, no, except I will say if it's an animal such as a raccoon or bear that is attracted to your garden or your garbage or your bird feeder, in that case, sometimes we do encourage people to, to haze the animal to Give them the lesson that, hey, this, don't, don't, we don't want you to be rewarded for being near people. So to be honest, we do sometimes encourage people, depending on the species, such as a bear, to uh, spook an animal purposefully in order to, to teach it that it's not welcome right against the house. But if it's for photography, I, I would be hesitant. Um, if trigger time is fairly long, we likely get more shots of an animal passing through by setting camera to shoot multiple shots per triggering event. So, yeah, one issue with trigger time being long is by the time the animals, I'm going to use my, walks in front of the camera, maybe it's almost out of view or is out of view before that camera goes off. You might get a leg. So, yeah, that's one issue with long trigger time is the animals already passed through, especially a fast-moving animal such as a fox or a coyote. And yeah, you either don't get anything or you just get a leg. So again, short trigger time as well as I always set my cameras to take three pictures per detection. So again, that way, if you, it's a quick trigger time and it gets three pictures, so hopefully you capture that animal somewhere in the frame of view of the camera. Um, I don't like to just do one, can, one photo per detection because you could miss something. Plus it could help with animal ID. Maybe one picture is blurry but because you took two more, one of those other two photos might be more clearer for species ID. So, yeah, fast trigger time. And, again, try to do at least three photos per detection um, rather than one when you set up your camera. What are your thoughts on using a salt lick for bait? I mean, it, it's going to attract the deer. And if that's your goal, that's, yeah, do it. Um, it's going to help you identify you know, how many does you have, how many bucks you have, the size of your bucks. Um, but just be in mind, I mean, I've seen pictures of salt licks in which you got raccoons licking on them too. And as a biologist, I'm always like, oh, worried about the disease concern. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind that you are artificially, you know, concentrating wildlife. And when we see artificial concentrations of wildlife, we're more likely to see disease transmission and outbreaks. Uh, Is Colin, there a way... Oh, or I was just going to Go say, ahead. maybe we could, we could stop there and uh, we'll just kind of finish and, and close up the meeting. And that way, the questions we didn't get to, if those folks want to hang on for just a few more minutes, okay. uh, they weren't planning to, uh, to stay past 2.30. Um, okay. But if they can, that would be great. And maybe we can get to the rest of those questions. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No worries. And I'll stay as long as needed to answer any questions. Okay, so uh, first of all, we always, uh, thank you Colleen for that, that was great. Um, of course, we always want to try to have a giveaway, try to make things fun. It's kind of hard to do that with this uh, virtual learning, but Mary Lyon, Mary Lyon and Anna Carter 
you two are lucky winners of our travel mugs, the Forester, North Carolina. So we will get your address, your email and send, shoot you an email and see if we can get a mailing address to kind of send you uh, a Forest Her North Carolina travel mug. So congratulations. Uh, for those that are not lucky winners, if you are interested in showing your support for Forest Her North Carolina or just like to have one, they are $22.50, which just includes the cost of getting them mailed back to you. Um, but you can send a check to the North Carolina Tree Farm Program. Just make sure it says Attention Forest Her North Carolina and uh, you can mail that check to NC Tree Farm Program at 1807 <laughs> Dunwick Court in Apex, North Carolina. And uh, Leslie will, will get that sent out to you. So show your support. One thing we do want to mention, we've still got some upcoming workshops. So save the dates for these. Uh, this was the first workshop in the Enjoying Your Woods uh, series. So we've got two more, one in February and one in March. So add that to your calendar and we hope to see you back then as well. Um, and then we'll start a new series in April about protecting your woods. So some cool things coming there as well. So add those to your calendar and we look forward to for you joining us. If you're looking to connect more with Forest Her, we've got a Facebook group where you can go on and ask questions, uh, try to maybe make a friend, find somebody nearby or might have the same interest or questions that you might have. So please check that out. If you're not a uh, if you're not a Facebook user, but maybe an Instagram, the same information is being found there. It's just we don't really have a, a good group to kind of connect or work with there. It's just sharing pictures or sharing information. Uh, but if you are not a social media person, no fear. Send us an email at forcernc <laughs> at gmail.com. If you've got questions or you'd just like to share your story. We'd love to be able to help you out or hear about it or, or maybe connect you with someone that can help you. So please, uh, definitely a lot of ways that you connect with us. And our website is coming soon. So we promise we'll, we'll get that updated real soon and we'll, we'll stop putting that on there. All right, well, we just wanna say thank you very much for joining us today, taking the time out. Uh, we hope you're getting outside. We hope you're staying safe. Uh, definitely stay positive, get outside and help your neighbor. And, uh, and share wildlife and, and viewing wildlife and nature photography with, with your neighbors and friends. As you leave, we would appreciate it if you would fill out the evaluation form that you will be taken to. It just helps us in the future work on the programs that you're interested in learning more about. So we would appreciate it if you just take a few minutes of your time and to complete that. But once again, thank you so much for joining us today and we appreciate it. Um, if you have a few more questions, please stay on. We've got several panelists here from the Wildlife Commission that are here on scene that can answer questions about photography with your smartphone. Mallory Henderson is still on. We've got Fallon Owens. We've got Deanna Noble, all are from the Wildlife Commission, as well as Colleen. So thank you. All right, hey, Colleen, let's go to so we'll just go back to answering some of those questions. Uh, looks like we do have a, a good crowd that's got that's staying on and want to see some of these answered. So let's go back to those questions, Colleen. And we'll let you try to finish some of those up. Um, Sounds good. Yep. The, the first one there, is there a way to remove the manufacturer's watermark from the on the game photo? Um, I haven't figured that out. <laughs> so no, I know, um, usually I don't mind. Uh, there might be a few situations where I'll crop it out. If I'm sharing it with someone or putting in a presentation, you can crop it out. But overall, I, I have not been able to find a way to do so. Um, but to be honest, I usually don't mind. To be honest, one benefit is if you end up using more than one camera brand, um, it might help you keep track of those, how well those different cameras work. Um, we do see sometimes even the advertised like trigger speed between camera brands might be reported as the same, but when we actually deploy both cameras together and test it out, one's a little bit faster than the rest. And as we're scrolling through photos, seeing that watermark actually helps us keep track of which camera is taking what photo um, to help us determine best brand. And that kind of, you know, one other tip I would have for you all is if you're still feeling overwhelmed and you're hesitant, you know, you want to buy quite a few cameras, you want to invest in deploying cameras on your property, uh, but you're hesitant to invest in just one brand, buy two different cameras, 
you know, maybe narrow it down to two cameras that you're thinking of getting and buy one of each, put them out together, either side by side or one on top of each other and see what happens. And, and then, you know, after a week or two weeks or a month, look, compare them. And that might help you make your final decision before you buy a bunch more. That's what I do as well. When I get down there, I'm like, boy, this browning looks good, but this Bushnell looks good too. I'll buy one of each and do a comparison test. And that'll help me make a decision before investing in a lot more money. Average cost of security boxes. Uh, not too bad. I mean, they're usually 20 to 40 bucks a piece, usually more on the 20 to $25 side of things. Um, it can add up if you're buying a bunch of cameras, but again, it's well worth it. And it really does not only help the camera from being stolen, so you know, your $25, $30 investment helps you save maybe a hundred or $200 camera, um, but it protects that camera just from damage, either just weather elements, wildlife, what have you. Um, it's a good investment. Someone asked, what about quail? And I assume, what about quail to use the real cameras on? Again, it, you can, it's possible. Um, but again, that's where sometimes with those smaller animals, detection can be lower, just it's really hard to capture. Um, so, you know, that's sometimes where maybe having a time lapse, you know, if you have an area where you think, you know, it's a, you know, part of the, your field, you think pretty positive that there's quail there, you might want to put your camera on a, a minute trigger where it's taking a photo every minute. And that guarantees that if there's hopefully quail there, you're going to get it on one of those photos, but that will result in a lot of photos. Um, yeah, quail and other small birds can be tricky. Another question, can images be seen remotely? If you buy the model that allows you to do so, yes, there are remote cameras that have cellular technology built in where then you set up the camera with whoever your carrier is, such as Verizon, and yes, those photos can go from the camera in the woods to your phone as a text. That's normally what happens, though I think you can also set it up for email. Um, they do tend to be more expensive, and uh, you usually have to buy a data plan to do that. Um, I've played around with them, but to be honest, uh, I've, I've, when you're talking about a lot of cameras, you might want to deploy that, that cost is going to add up. So I don't really use it all that often, but it might be fun just putting one camera out and doing it on your property. Um, so yes, they can, but it can become expensive due to the data plans. Yeah, thoughts on using cellular versus non-cellular trail cameras in terms of cost, value, time, are they worth it, bottom line? You know, if you check, I would always say, always go visit your cameras at least once a month or once every two months. Not only to make sure there's still plenty of batteries, that you don't have to swap out the batteries, but also to make sure uh, your memory card isn't full, to make sure that the camera hasn't been messed with or stolen. So to me, you're going to be going out to see your camera um, anyway, at least once or twice, you know, once a month or maybe every two months. Um, so, I mean, I would only invest in a cellular camera if you really, really want to know on a daily basis what your camera is taking pictures of. If, if that's a need, then I would do it. And to be honest, the only need I've seen is there, there are places, landowners, as well as uh, agencies such as USDA Wildlife Services, that is really making an effort to eradicate feral hogs. And so, you know, they, they really want to know where the feral hogs are on the property, as well as they set up these what are called corral traps. And there's a need for them to know when pigs start to visit those traps. So they know, all right, let, let's activate that trap. Having those photos sent to them via, you know, the cell technology is very important. But otherwise, I'd say for most people, I wouldn't bother, at least not now. Maybe if it gets cheaper in the future, but for now, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, oh, <laughs> Which is your favorite camera? Boy, <laughs> I, I'll, I'm going to tell you the cameras I'm using um, because as a state agency employee, I'm not allowed to endorse <laughs> people or manufacturers. I am going to tell you that the camera I use is I was using Bushnell Aggressors. Um, unfortunately, Bushnell no longer makes that model called the Aggressor. So I've used to using the Bushnell Core HD um, that has a no-glow infrared flash. 
Um, detection is incredible uh, right now. From what I've seen with the Bushnell cores I've deployed, uh, the detection's great. But that's one that has the half door at the bottom. And so I'm seeing more, I'm seeing some of my cameras fail. Um, that uh, I think is a bit premature. And I think community is getting in there. I think it's a design flaw. So pictures are great. Detection's great. Trigger speed's great. Battery use is fantastic. But yeah, some of the cameras are failing. So um, I'm going to be looking into some others. I will say I've really been impressed with Browning. Some of my colleagues use Browning um, and get really good pictures as well as uh, good trigger speeds. All right. Yeah, do you have a suggestion for how to select a remote camera? Um, I don't know if it's possible, but uh, you know, I shared that resources uh, tab. Um, you know, I'd say one of the uh, go-to websites that you could overall trust. If I can, uh, oh shoot, where'd it go? So I'm trying to find the. It's that Trail Cam Pro. I think if you Google Trail Cam Pro, you should be able to find it. Um, now they sell trail cameras. They used to just review remote cameras. Now they sell them. So still take their reviews with a grain of salt because maybe they're getting paid. But overall, they have a great information. And I do think they do some good reviews. I mean, they review just about every remote camera that's on the market and talk about the pluses and, and, and uh, minuses. Um, so that's a good spot to go to. Um, I purchase all my cameras through a company called Camlock Box. Cam lock box. They're based out of uh, either Wisconsin or Minnesota. And I go to them because I can buy my camera, my Python locks, and my security boxes all from them, as well as they will key my locks all the same. So say you're going to deploy 25, 30 cameras with locks. You don't want to have 30 different keys. <laughs> you want them all key to like. So that cam lock box website I showed is a place where you can talk directly to them. I always call them up. I don't do it online. I call them up, and they can work me through the process of making sure I get the right security box for my camera, the locks I need, as well as make sure they're all keyed the same. So I only have to carry one set of keys instead of a bunch of different keys. How do you remember where you left your cameras? <laughs> I write down, I write it down. Uh, you don't have to have a GPS necessarily, uh, but to be honest, I actually take my smartphone and go to Google Maps and drop a pin. And then on top of that, and label that pin, on top of that, I have a data sheet I fill out that describes things, such as I have some cameras off Highway 64, and I'll say, stop when you're within view of the Angus, you know, Angus Barn billboard sign. Um, and then go in where you see the flat tire. Um, it is easy to forget where these are, especially say, you know, when you put a camera out in the summertime, it's going to look a lot different in wintertime with the leaves gone or vice versa. So try to drop a pin in Google Maps or Google Earth um, or whatever type of mapping app you have, as well as write it down. Keep a data sheet so you can keep track of how many cameras you deployed and write a description of where they're at. That also helps you keep track of, you know, say cameras failed, which one failed at what site. Okay. Would you note the site you recommended for evaluation or comparison? Yes, Liz, I think I said that, but our uh, Trail Cam Pro. Um, again, I can't endorse them as a place to buy the cameras, but I do go to them to, to read their reviews of cameras. And, and, and of all the resources I've seen online, um, they, they seem to know what they're talking about. Okay. SpyPoint makes cost-effective cellular trail cameras as well as a device called CellLink that makes almost any trail camera remote. Hmm. Any experience with this device? I, I have to admit, no. Um, I, I, I don't have experience, but I might look into it. Um, you know, I'm going to admit to you all I'm not a technophile. I'm a technophobe. Um, so which is, leads to if, if I can work these cameras, you can, because <laughs> I'm not a technophile. I do not have an Alexa or a Google Home or a Ring or any of that stuff, and I don't plan to. Um, so, yeah, I'm not aware of this spy point, but it's definitely something I'll, I'll, I'll look into to see if it has any application for my surveys. All right. Um, I, questions? I'll ask the rest of the uh, panelists if, if if I missed a question or 
if they want to address any of the questions, uh, yeah. Or if there's any more questions from the audience. Looks like you're, you're doing a great job. So we've still got about 50 people on. So if you've got more questions, type them in that Q&A. Uh, Mallory Henderson is still on here too, as well as Colleen. Or if you have some other questions you'd just like to ask a couple of other biologists that are on here, um, you know, feel free. We'll try to get those. We also have folks behind the scenes. Uh, Amy Tomcho, Kelly Douglas, Bob, you know, if you've got questions, you know, we can we'd be more than happy to answer. Um, looks like one more calling for you would be the, yep. would the lock box prevent water damage? Um, no, because they're, the, the lock boxes aren't waterproof. Um, though they, they, uh, they can, um, they can protect your, you know, from, from other weather related, uh, I guess, uh, factors. Um, but no, they're not waterproof, um, but still I would recommend them um, a, as something to buy. When do right. bears typically, oh. Go ahead, I was just gonna read that out and see if you wanted to, to <laughs> take a stab at that, but go ahead. Yeah, so someone asked, uh, when do bears typically hibernate in Western North Carolina? Oh, bears, uh, they're just like, to anthropomorphize, but um, they all definitely have their individual personality quirks. We typically see bears can start denning as early as mid-October and go into hibernation as late as early January. Um, as well as, you know, we're starting to see more and more bears, especially male bears or female bears that aren't going to have cubs. So your female bears with yearlings are sometimes not hibernating, but staying active all winter, partly because winter's pretty mild now, as well as there's a lot of food available. Unfortunately, artificial food like bird feeders and garbage. Um, one reason bears traditionally hibernated is it was a time period in which they went to hibernation because there wasn't any food around and temperatures were really cold. So they decided, hey, might as well just hibernate and sleep through this time of food scarcity and harsh weather conditions. Well, we're seeing that change, you know, milder climate, as well as more artificial food. But if a bear is going to hibernate, yeah, I'd say the earliest we've detected a bear hibernating in Western North Carolina was mid-October. It was a female that eventually had cubs, as well as we've seen female bears with cubs um, not start hibernation until early January, and then they have their cubs just a few weeks later. Um, follow up, cubs being born. Cubs can be as born as early as late December. It used to be most cubs were born kind of late January through mid-February, but we're starting to see that time period expand. And, and actually, uh, just last week, we almost had two cub orphaning events in which a, a female bear was disturbed. She left the den, and there are cubs inside. Um, luckily, female bears have a good motherly instinct and both returned to their, to their den and their cubs, so everything was fine. out of questions there but if anybody else that's still out there we've we've got several people online here if you've got some more questions send them to us we'd love to try to answer it looks like we've got about nine more minutes left and we could try to get to some of these but um uh, anybody else want to uh want to speak mallory you have anything to, to add or provide or yeah. I was going to say um, one of the things uh, Brady kind of glossed over it pretty quickly, but it's one of my favorite tricks is turning the phone upside down. Um, that really does like give you a totally different um, angle and just a different perspective on your photos. I highly recommend trying it out, um, especially with things if you're like kind of low to the ground um, and you're trying to get a good angle on something. If you literally just flip your phone upside down, um, it'll give you a much wider kind of range of angles that you can take from, um, and it should automatically turn the photo right side back up um, once you turn the phone over. Awesome, yeah, that was a good trick. We had some, some cool tricks in there. I kind of took out my photo, my phone. I had never seen the one where you hold it down and try to move the light on the side. I guess that's what they were calling a macro photo. So I thought that was pretty interesting. 
Maybe that's just me. <laughs> All right, well, we got a few more minutes. Um, if nobody else has any questions, then we'll give folks just another minute or two to, to pass, pass anything. But it looks like we've got a, a lot of great comments. Colleen, uh, the information was definitely very helpful. So they, uh, our participants thoroughly enjoyed enjoyed your presentation as well as Bex. And Mallory, thanks for being here to answer all these questions. Because, all right, how about this one? Uh, let's see, this question might be more suited to future webinars, but can you suggest books about hiking with kids? Any uh, panelists out there? Have any good books about hiking with kids? I mean, I have two young girls myself. I don't know that I have any good books per se for the for them. Um, but of course, hiking with kids can be troublesome sometimes because <laughs> they're always hungry and they never want to keep continuing. And then when they say they're tired, all of a sudden they found their second win. Anybody else Jennifer? have any books? Yeah. This is Kelly. I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. Um, I was going to just suggest the uh, try to find some hiking books that are uh, for, you know, North Carolina, local native, um, but try to find the ones that are labeled as easy because those are going to be a lot better for kids. They'll be shorter. They won't be as challenging usually, and you might be able to keep them with you longer. And I think, and usually if you, if you're looking up some of those trails online, like say if you're looking at a trail that the park service runs or, um, Usually you can go online and, and see those trails and they'll list that easy, moderate, um, it's the strenuous, I think is the other one. So those are great. There's also some hiking. Uh, I know I, I've, I've been following one on Facebook. If you're a social media person, there's a, a hiking in North Carolina. Seems like some folks are always asking those same questions as well. Maybe something good to follow if you're kind of kind of new to hiking or just looking for some good, easy trails particularly one that may take you out and then come back to the same spot if you don't have someone to, to pick you up on the other end or something. Looks like uh, Bob Barton suggested the All Trails app. So that would be a good one in ecoexplorer.net. So that looks like two good, two good options there. Thanks, Bob and Amy. Questions? All right, folks. Well, that looks like about all the, the questions we've got. So uh, with that, we've just got about four minutes. So um, I think this was great. A lot of great comments for uh, what was provided. So good to hear, good to see. All right, so I think maybe we can, we can call it a, a great meeting. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, as a panelist, I had a lot of fun participating. So thanks for having me and thanks everyone for uh, listening. Thanks everyone.